Hello, I'm Martin Park. You can call me coach. For those that don't know me, I'm a naturopath and a master coach and trainer who has been working professionally in the health, fitness, wellness and self-improvement industries for over 45 years. If you are someone who is interested in learning how to maximize your overall health, well-being and performance, then welcome to the channel. Today I'm going to talk about the power of positive thinking, manifestation, versus the power of positive action, transformation. The power of positive thinking, the belief in manifesting, also known as the law of attraction, revolves around the idea that focusing on positive thoughts, intentions and affirmations can bring desired outcomes into one's life. This concept has gained traction in various self-help and spiritual communities, with proponents advocating for techniques such as visualization, gratitude practices and positive affirmations as tools for achieving goals and attracting abundance. In contrast, the power of positive action, transformation, underscores the pivotal role of tangible actions and deliberate efforts in driving meaningful change, fostering success and facilitating personal growth. This perspective emphasizes the importance of actively engaging in behaviors and practices aligned with one's goals, highlighting that genuine progress stems from proactive steps and consistent, dedicated actions, rather than solely relying on positive thoughts and intentions. Now that is simplifying it all, but that is the basics of what they are. So let's have a look at this more carefully, and perhaps more importantly for you as a listener, and perhaps a listener who already has a leaning towards one approach over the other, why should you even listen to me on this subject at all? Allow me to explain. As of this podcast, I am 67 years old. I started working full-time when I was 14 years and 6 months old. This was the earliest anyone was allowed to leave school back in 1971, and to do so you needed an approval letter from a parent, which I got from my mother. My first job, and it was always only going to be a temporary job, as I had bigger plans, was working full-time at a suburban supermarket, packing the shelves and working the cash register. I worked there until I was 15, which was the age you had to be to apply for a job as a projectionist apprenticeship in a movie cinema, which was something I'd wanted to do since I was nine years old after watching Doctor Who and the Daleks in 1966 with my dad at a cinema in Halifax, England, where I was born, and instantly falling in love with movies and the cinema. So the moment I turned 15, I applied for a job at Hoyt's Theatres and I got it. My first position was working as a spoolboy at the Mayfair Cinema in Castle Ray Street, Sydney, screening Cabaret with Liza Minnelli. There were two shifts, the morning and the afternoon, and I worked the afternoon shift, which started at 4.30pm and finished at 11.30pm. Going to work, I would get off the train at Town Hall Station and walk to the cinema from there. And on the walk from the station to the cinema, I would pass a bookshop in Clarence Street called the Adyar Bookshop. And I remember when I walked past it for the first time, I didn't just see it, I smelt it, as they were burning some incense sticks at the front door to let everyone know that they were different. They weren't like the camera shop that you just passed, or the sandwich shop, or the clothes shop, they were different. The Adyar Bookshop was a mind, body, spirit bookshop, specialising in metaphysical and alternative books, and it had been open since 1922. They had an extensive range of books covering subject areas such as astrology, paganism, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, comparative religion, Eastern medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, alternative health, alternative education, Jungian psychology, mythology, self-help, psychology, spirit teachings, theosophy, Western mysteries, yoga and many many more subjects. Once I found this shop, my daily routine was to get there by 12 p.m., then sit on the floor and read until 4 p.m., which then gave me enough time to get to work by 4.30 p.m. It was perfect. I went every day, six days a week, sitting on the floor and reading until I had to go to work, and I did that for four hours a day, six days a week, for three years. Clearly the epitome of a nerdy young boy who didn't have a girlfriend or any friends at all for that matter. But that didn't matter to me at all at that time, as I was young and keen and I was learning things, mind-boggling things. And in relation to today's topic, where we are looking at the not-so-new but still very popular concept of manifestation and the law of attraction, I read seven books. They were, and in no particular order, Science of Mind by Ernest Holmes, Consciously Creating Circumstances by George Winslow Plummer, The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale, As a Man Thinketh by James Allen, the Secret Science Behind Miracles by Max Freedom Long, 
The Game of Life and How to Play It by Florence Scovel Shin and The Master Key System by Charles F. Hunnell. And I read them all in a block of time, probably around seven weeks, as they were all in the same section, and that is what I did. I would read everything that I found interesting in a section until I had exhausted it, then I'd moved to another section and repeat. Those seven books were the only books on the subject that they had at the time I was there. So, because I found this super interesting, and I mean seriously, I would have been 16 when I was introduced to this, and I'm reading all this stuff and being told that all I had to do was use the power of my mind and thoughts, and I would get everything that I wanted, then who in their right mind wouldn't want a piece of that? I don't know, but I certainly did. So, I went to the State Library on my Sunday off, and via their microfilm copies of newspaper articles along with a few books, I researched and looked into the history of the whole New Thought movement, which, for those that don't know, was a philosophical and spiritual movement that emerged in the 19th century in the United States that emphasized the power of positive thinking, personal growth, and the interconnectedness of mind, body, and spirit to manifest desired outcomes in life. I read everything I could find on Phineas Quimby, William Walker Atkinson, Mary Baker Eddy, Thomas Troward, and anyone else that had anything to do with this. Back at the Adyar bookshop, I asked the staff, who, might I add, were very supportive of some skinny young boy coming in every day and reading without ever buying anything, often bringing me cups of herbal tea to sip as I read, or asking me if I would like a sandwich or some fruit or something, which was very kind of them. Anyway, I told them of my readings and my research and thoughts, and I asked them for any advice as to how to continue. They pointed me towards ancient Hindu philosophy, Buddhist philosophy, Greek philosophy, and other spiritual traditions including Hermeticism, Islam, Judaism, Transcendentalism, and secular philosophical traditions such as Humanism and Existentialism. And I sat and I read and I read and I read, all with a focus on this topic of manifesting as my driving force. The more I read across these diverse traditions, the more it became clear to me that there was a shared understanding that belief or faith is not merely a passive acceptance of ideas or principles, but rather a call to action, a call to embody those beliefs through ethical conduct, compassionate deeds, and a commitment to making a positive difference in the world via positive actions. Whether it was through the concept of karma yoga in Hinduism, the Noble Eightfold Path in Buddhism, the principles of Iman and Amal in Islam, the concept of Tikkun Olam in Judaism, or the many examples put forward by the secular ethical philosophies, the message remained consistent. Faith without corresponding action is incomplete. Now I could have just left it there, as I was now feeling that I'd reached the end of my theoretical studies in relation to this topic as a novice. I felt comfortable in my conclusion that, while maintaining a positive attitude was undeniably important, it is through taking positive action that we truly harness the power to shape our destinies. But I was also aware that this was just the conclusion that I had come up with. Perhaps someone else could have studied and read all the same material that I had accessed, yet they came up with a completely different point of view, perhaps even the opposing point of view. So that thought was niggling and it wouldn't go away. I needed to, as they say, hear it from the horse's mouth. I needed to talk to people who were already very successful in their chosen field. So I did. I spoke to everyone I could find that I even remotely knew and that I believed had achieved some form of success. And what I asked them was, which contributed more to your success, your thoughts and beliefs, or your actions? And it was fascinating. Everyone had a different story to tell. Some firmly believed that it was their thoughts and beliefs that shaped their success, while others believed it was their hard work and the actions they took that made it all happen. They were animated and spoke with passion, and I could feel how they were happy to discuss this topic, as it seemed to bring back memories of the struggles and the challenges that they had lived through alongside the joys and the success. Some people who I'd already made an assumption on as to what they would say had the opposite point of view. The minister of the Baptist church that I had attended Sunday school as a child, a man of faith and beliefs, told me how if it wasn't for him taking a what for him was an extreme action by leaving his home country as a young man of 19 and emigrating to Australia on his own, he would never have found his calling. 
Yet when I asked the retired owner of a garbage removal company that was worth millions, a company that he single-handedly built on his own with his hard work and efforts and sacrifices, he didn't hesitate to say it was his beliefs that got him to be where he was today. He said with great conviction that without his absolute belief and faith in himself to achieve what he wanted, no matter how hard it got, he would have never have taken any action at all. So, as I sought a definitive answer to my quest for meaning regarding the debate between beliefs and actions, what I discovered was a much more intricate picture, one rich with complexity and nuance of human experience, one that suggests that outcomes aren't solely determined by one's thoughts, beliefs or actions in isolation, but rather are influenced by a multitude of other factors as well, such as social, economic and environmental factors alongside a dash of good luck to boot. That was all when I was a younger man of 15, 16. I'm now a mature man with a much greater knowledge and understanding and experience. So do I still feel the same about this question? Is this still a mystery to me? I will leave you with this. Action serves as the bridge linking our aspirations to our achievements and our dreams to our realities. So keep on believing, keep on dreaming, and most importantly, keep on applying tangible actions and efforts toward your goals. Thank you for tuning in. I appreciate your company. If you found value in today's episode, then please hit the subscribe, like or follow buttons to help me with growing my channel. I look forward to spending some time with you again. Bye for now.